Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody, to Old Stories, New Ways, the evolution of Indigenous narratives and games. Um, and thank you for joining us on a Sunday morning. Uh, it's really great to see everybody here. Um, real quick, before we get started, I wanted to say we won't be able to keep an eye on chat the whole time. Uh, so if you do have a question, please use the Q&A feature below. Uh, we'll answer as many questions as we can uh, at the end. Um, please be respectful. Keep your questions PG rated. And of course, thanks to our awesome moderators, Lucy and Boots, uh, who got us set up and looking great. Um, so uh, I'll do some brief introductions. You know, who are we? Uh, my name is Chris Apple. I'm the IT manager for Sparky Pants Studios. Uh, they make the Elder Scrolls Legend, which is the collectible card game. My name is Lisa Kincaid. I am a civil servant for the federal government. I grew up in rural Oklahoma, uh, playing video games at the convenience store, uh, pinball, and uh, stand-up arcade games. I then joined the Marine Corps and then ended up in Virginia. I'm also of uh, registered Sack and Fox and of Cheyenne, Southern Cheyenne descent. Hey folks, my name is uh, Dustin Tai Richardson. Um, I am a mixed blood, um, basically Scots-Irish and a Blackfeet descendant. Um, I'm also the clinical director of Native American Lifelines, which is a Title V urban Indian healthcare program that operates both in Maryland and Massachusetts. Um, I'm also a licensed clinical counselor for Maryland. Um, and just on that note, so we just kind of wanted to give folks a heads up um, just about some of the content of the presentation. Uh, we do talk about some fun stuff, but we also talk about some hard stuff. So um, unfortunately with, you know, discussing Native American rights and anything indigenous, um, a lot of times you do have to give it the proper honor by talking about things of, you know, like sexual assault or rape, um, genocide, um, you know, mass relocation. So not always things that are super happy on the Sunday morning, but um, I promise that, you know, there's, there's some laughs hopefully in here as well. Um, and then just to give a quick breakdown on the presentation. So we're just gonna give some background just on some general information on Native Americans in the United States, just to, to give some context and we'll do that throughout the presentation. Um, we're gonna be talking about a psychological model of acculturation that we use to kind of better understand um, the lens of the development of a lot of these games and really look at, okay, from a psychological perspective, how do these influence acculturation? Um, then we're just going to be talking about the games themselves, um, and then we're going to end with a little bit of Q&A, um, and hopefully we get, you know, a little bit of information. And then Lisa? All right, so we're going to start off uh, covering a little background in storytelling and indigenous cultures. Uh, storytelling is the backbone of tradition. Uh, it serves as a link between the past, the present, and a way to the future, sharing history, education, humor, and even healing. It's predominantly an oral tradition, but different cultures have used weaving, pottery, paintings, and drawings, evolving and adapting whenever need, they needed to, uh, to carry on their ways. Hmm. And yeah, and what we're looking at even with this is just, you know, video games are an incredible way to tell a story um, that's incredibly immersive. So as they're telling these stories of Native and Indigenous people, really, um, when Indigenous folks are seeing these games, what are the consequences for them? But then also when non-Indigenous people see them, um, really, what are the consequences as well? Um, so just a quick overview of some demographics, not going to beat you um, too much, but, you know, approximately 1.2% of the U.S. population, around 4 million Americans identify as being Native American or having Alaskan Native heritage. Given that um, number changes a lot based on the U.S. Census, um, it'll be interesting this year, especially with COVID, once we get the census data, but um, it's important to see that, yeah, it's a substantial population. Um, this number is actually a little bit old. So there's 574 federally recognized tribes currently. Um, that does change because some people fall off enrollment and some people, you know, fall on. Um, but, you know, they're speaking over 200 indigenous languages. Um, about between 70 to 78 percent, depending on the year of Native Americans, live um, in urban settings, uh, suburban, or really anywhere that's not a reservation. So at the end of the day, I know most folks will think of Native Americans as being on a reservation with a casino, but um, more often than not, Natives are living off reservations in the United States right now. 
Um, in terms of just some hard demographic numbers, you know, Native Americans have an incredibly high rate of victimization. It's, you know, double that of African Americans and 2.5 that of Caucasians. Um, and compared to the U.S. population, you know, Native Americans are going to be a lot more likely to live in poverty. Um, and unfortunately, also Native Americans are uh, twice as likely to be unemployed as compared to Caucasians. So that's just not even... Uh, yeah, that's a small part of the demographics. Um, now, in terms of also just something important to mention, um, in terms of suicidality and, and suicide, again, this is, I promise it gets happier. Um, but, you know, overall in the U.S., um, there's a huge issue of suicide increasing. And this is a problem that's happening nationally, and it's drawing a lot of attention. Um, I actually sit on the Maryland Commission for Suicide Prevention, um, and really, you know, it, it's a national issue that even with COVID-19, there's a lot of concern about. Um, with the increasing issues of suicide, um, it's just worthwhile to mention that Native Americans on this green little line um, have the highest rates of suicide. And it's increasing faster than other demographics and other populations. Uh, and, you know, while a lot of attention has gotten paid as it should to some of the other groups where we're seeing more suicidality, um, really Native Americans, a lot in research, but particularly in funding, really don't get the same level of attention or care. Um, so for all of this, you know, presentation, we're going to be doing in therapy, we call it broaching culture. But really what it means is coming in an authentic way to, you know, a place um, with whatever you are. So, you know, whatever your culture is, and I'm sure you can know, uh, you folks are probably a mix, um, you know, just your racial background, you know, um, just anything that you grew up with that was important, both ethically as well as personally. Um, all of these things built into your culture and it builds into how you relate to others and their culture. Um, and really we want people to feel, you know, comfortable asking questions, um, you know, with the Q&A, please feel free if you have any questions at any point. Um, and we're very happy you know, to talk about them during the presentation or even a little bit after um, if things run over. So I'm gonna keep going. Um, so Helms is white model racial development. Um, Helms was basically a social psychologist uh, who was, you know, and still is well thought of um, in terms of trying to better understand kind of race and um, acculturation, Holmes really looked at developing a model that looked primarily at like a dominant culture. Um, and so her model was called, you know, the rate of white racial identity model. But it really looked at how um, a dominant race of people kind of understood, you know, minority populations and how they started to explore their identity and also understand another identity. So the first stage in the model was contact. Um, contact is basically mm, kind of being of the status quo, um, having kind of what a lot of people may think of as a humanistic uh, perspective of like, we're all human beings. This is really a, a colorblindness. So almost like not acknowledging race or racism and uh, really not acknowledging the importance of it. It's the lowest part of the model, um, which sometimes does trip people up. Um, after that, it's disintegration. So really, it's having a bit of anxiety or disorientation, um, knowing that race may matter in some degree. Um, and basically, it forces someone to think that maybe in some ways discrimination may exist. Um, it tends to be a place where people, you know, may feel some guilt and shame. Um, and it usually leads to people wanting to, you know, do something positive with these emotions, but maybe not knowing what to actually do. Um, reintegration, this is an interesting one because it tends to be uh, like you idolize your racial group. Um, you tend to be more intolerant of other groups. Um, this is a place where you tend to have a lot of blame the victim mentality. So, you know, for example, unfortunately we've had a lot of things in the news that are sad. Um, but, you know, if you see, you know, an African-American man, you know, running through an upscale neighborhood and someone thinks, he doesn't belong there and he ends up getting assaulted or arrested um, and someone says, well, he shouldn't have been there. Well, that's a very much a blame the victim mentality um, and it's also a part of reintegration. Um, it's also a place where people feel that they 
may be able to like expound some of their racist ideas. So this is a stage where I always kind of talk about like Archie Bunker or Eric Cartman, you know, people who like they're racist basically and they're acknowledging it um, and they're expounding and, you know, saying reasons why that their group is superior to others. Um, again, this is actually higher than contact and, you know, like being kind of colorblind, um, which can be confusing to folks, but, you know, at least like Eric Cartman acknowledges that people aren't the same and that, you know, they do have some different cultures. He doesn't necessarily respect it, but, you know, again, there's at least an acknowledgement. Um, next off is pseudo-independence. So really, this is a person beginning to attempting uh, to kind of understand racial, cultural, sexual orientation differences um, and actually have a more legitimate, like, understanding and interaction with some of these minority groups. Um, approval, you know, you, you end up, you know, slowly kind of systematically doing a little bit more to better understand issues, but um, it's still you know, kind of surface level. Um, and then really you're gonna understand any other cultures based on your own as well. Um, the next stage is really um, immersion. Immersion, um, and an individual in this stage basically really does try to make um, an effort to combat racism and by also understanding their own cultural identity. Um, folks tend to look at their own privilege and their own personal history um, and they tend trying to understand just, you know, methods of preferred growth. Um, normally there's a desire to, you know, seek out individuals who also have been through this as well. So, you know, this is someone who, for example, they may have gone to like a Black Lives Matter meeting. Um, and while in the crowd, you know, they're talking with some, you know, other Caucasian folks who um, are trying to better understand like what they can do to kind of move forward. And the very last stage is autonomy. So this is a stage where really um, things are integrated. You're able to understand your own identity without you know, guilt or shame. You have positive connections with that identity. You're actively pursuing social justice um, or really whatever is kind of perceived to be social justice. And you're also really appreciating other people and probably also drawing on it to make you uh, more comfortable and you know, a better rounded person. So, and don't worry if you don't remember all this, we'll be touching on the model throughout. This was, you know, a five minute lecture on something that I could spend about mm, probably 60 minutes on. But anyway, so we're gonna start talking about games. Yes, see, you got through it. You got through the sad stuff, most of it anyway. Um, but anyway, so just content warning. Um, this does have a little bit of cartoon nudity. We do have um, some adult images, but not, we really have like two. Um, and it's not, I would say, detailed in any way because it's, you know, 80s graphics design. But the first game we're going to be talking about is Custer's Revenge. Um, this was a very interesting game based off of uh, the very famous uh, cavalry off officer, George Armstrong Custer. Um, it was an interesting game in terms of its development and uh, release. So it was made for the Atari um, by Mystique. And interestingly enough, uh, Mystique felt like um, they were actually primarily an adult company uh, making, you know, essentially adult based materials for folks. Um, but they actually thought that video games were the next step in, you know, pornography. Um, and the goal of the game itself, you know, kind of didn't drive some of those ideas, but you can drive with a whole lot of things. But the basic premise of the game was to dodge arrows in order to reach basically a, a captive Native American woman tied to the pole and then rape her. Um, immediately when the game came out, women's groups and Native American organizations spoke out at its release um, for obvious reasons. And ironically, there was an article that came up about a possible remake um, which I have a link to at the very bottom. Don't know if it's actually real or if somebody's just trolling, but you know, it's an interesting piece. So, you know, this is the game itself, um, you know, and unfortunately you're dodging arrows in order to do this, whatever this is. Um, and it's a game that is generally you know, offensive for a whole bunch of reasons, but a lot of people with the historical background of culture, you know, it sits on the back of westward expansion, an idea of manifest destiny of really pushing out natives and, um, and understanding 
to, you know, the United States that, you know, there was an entitlement to the land that they had held for, you know, ever. Um, and it was uh, precursors to the Indian Removal Act as well as the Trail of Tears. Um, the Battle of Little Bighorn is, is a very interesting piece of, you know, just the narrative within the United States. So most newspapers of the time published it as Custer's Last Stand or, you know, essentially a massacre. Um, for Native Americans, it was the Battle of the Greasy Grass. And really, at the core of it, you know, you had multiple tribes come together both to discuss and um, try to make a plan for how to deal with these issues of westward expansion as the U.S. government continued to encroach on their land and had broken the treaties that had originally formalized and uh, stabilized the region. Um, and they had gotten together really for, for protection as they had that discussion um, because the U.S. cavalry was in the process of, you know, taking out any smaller band or clan that was isolated. And so Custer um, wrote in actually before his reinforcements, um, kind of had a doom plan from the start. If you look at it from a military perspective, he was actually not armed uh, nearly as well as the natives. And I think that's also a tremendous misinterpretation. Like people think that, you know, um, the natives who were there were just armed with bows and arrows on horseback. Well, actually, they primarily had repeating rifles. Um, Custard actually had a older model of muzzle-borne and uh, chamber-loaded model, but they were single shot and slower. Um, so it really, you know, was a poor military decision, not necessarily that natives just wanted to massacre Custard. Um, but, you know, the battle also sits on the historic uh, Wounded Knee Massacre, which was a massacre, in my opinion, um, where, you know, the 7th Cavalry, which again, this was Custer's Cavalry, um, obviously, not for the most part, the same people, but, you know, 14 years after his death, it, there was a clear message, basically, after, you know, Custer's defeat to really push forth and, you know, obliterate any Native resistance in the West. Um, so, the game takes place, you know, and on the backdrop of all of these, you know, big historic things, but it doesn't really respect it. Um, now, just in the terms of like the U.S.'s development while this happening, you know, as this game was being made, two very important acts were happening. So one was the Indian Mineral Development Act, which, so essentially, um, it encouraged tribes to manage and uh, utilize a lot of the resources that were on their land and you know, their reservations. And it's important to say that even with all of the land taken, um, about 25% of the US's mineral wealth um, is actually on reservations. Um, and this was especially during you know, the, the 80s, basically. Um, unfortunately, what this act actually did was really push um, and allow for corporations to come onto native owned lands. Um, and do illegal mining. And so, you know, we've seen this, um, for example, in the Four Corners, you know, with Navajo Nation, um, prim uh, primarily with uranium mining. Um, this was part of the big issue, even with the pipeline. Um, and unfortunately, for most of us, we know kind of how that panned out. Um, so, again, context for the game. And then, you know, we also had the Seminole Tribe versus Mother War Supreme court decision, again, not a lot of people necessarily know, but really what it did is it upheld the right for tribes to have uh, casinos and gambling on their land, um, which for a lot of tribes is basically one of the few economic um, ways that they can become independent, because also a lot of people don't necessarily want to mine, you know, a lot of the lands that they're on, which, you know, they consider to be sacred. So, Custer's Revenge, what we did in terms of the analysis is, we, you know, we really felt that it was within contact. Um, we really did feel like that it was, um, people were blind to racism, sexism. Um, so, you know, we really want to make sure that hopefully games in the future actually have some context. Um, and again, you know, just acknowledge any type of race. And... I'm going to go ahead and Turok, and then we also might do a short poll, so I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Yes, so uh, we actually have a couple of polls we wanted to uh, have you guys do. Um, the first poll is going to be, do you identify as indigenous? And if you feel comfortable responding, please do. 
Um, while you guys are responding to that, I'm going to talk a, bit, a little bit about Turok Dinosaur Hunter. So um, fast forward to the 90s. Uh, uh oh. My mistake. Fast forward too far. Fast, yeah, very fast forward. <laughs> There we go. So um, you play in Turok as Tal Set, a Saquin warrior, and assume the mantle of Turok. So Turok is actually a title, not a name. And the Saquin are a fictitious Native American tribe to whom you belong. Turok is a time traveling warrior who protects the barrier between Earth and the Lost Land, a place where time has no meaning. And there you fight dinosaurs and also robot dinosaurs collecting pieces of a powerful artifact to ultimately challenge this guy who calls himself the campaigner, who wants to rule all of time by deleting the barrier between the lost land and earth. And if you didn't realize Turok had such a crazy complex plot line, you are not alone. Um, and in fact, where did this story come from? Well, before Turok was a video game, it was a comic book. Uh, the creators wanted to tell a story about antiquity, so they chose a pre-Columbian people, a fictitious one, who would get stuck in the lost land and have to survive in kind of a multi-generational way. I didn't mean to click that. Um, and uh, when it was turned into a game in the 90s, Acclaim took some creative liberties with it. Uh, they made him a time traveler. They changed it to be a lot more action-oriented. Um, but they kept his Native American identity. So why change part of the stories but leave that identity intact? Well, there are a lot of possible explanations. Uh, some contemporary events might have influenced the decisions. There was some legislation uh, that might have done it. But I want to take a look at the cinema at the time. Um, so this is what we're seeing in the cinema uh, as the game is being developed and released. Um, these films have large budgets. They have a lot of marketing that go, and um, they really go beyond the kind of cowboys and Indians trope of the previous decades. We see mainstream studios that are beginning to explore native cultures in more depth. They're beginning to do research and bring on cultural advisors. Um, they're beginning to think about historical accuracy. And at the same time, they're starting to portray native characters as protagonists and more complex protagonists. Um, in some ways, these films are still about white men, and they all have some issues that might reappear later in our presentation. Um, but though they're perhaps problematic, uh, mainstream media is at least showing an appetite to explore these cultures. Um, and so we actually want to take a minute and do our second poll here and say, um, were you excited about these films when they came out? And if so, which one? Um, so I'll let you guys answer that a little bit. Um, so where on the acculturation model does Turok fall? Well, I put it somewhere between contact and disintegration. Uh, recall that contact is kind of an obliviousness to the differences between race and culture. So, you know, we're, we're all the same. I'm colorblind. I don't see color. Um, and disintegration is where you begin to realize that discrimination might exist. Um, and you might even try to stop it or help, but your understanding of the cultural differences is shallow, so your attempts to help um, might not be effective, or they might actually wind up making things worse. I think that the Turok character is not intentionally disparaging, so he's not satire, but I don't think he's really representative either. Um, I don't know too many people who took a look at Turok there and said, yeah, that guy, you know, I totally get what he's going through. I can identify with him. Um, He's kind of removed from any historical or cultural context. Uh, so he doesn't bring any aspect of his own culture, even a fictitious one, to the game. Um, and in that regard, his portrayal is kind of hard to understand. Why choose an indigenous portrayal if you're not going to do anything with it? Um, you may have noticed he's wearing a hairbone necklace, uh, sort of an iconic piece of Plains tribe regalia. Uh, and if, like me, you were wondering if that would really protect him from a dinosaur attack, here he is on the front of the box, not being protected from a dinosaur attack by the hair, hairbone necklace. Um, Talset hails from the 19th century, um, where hairbone necklace was losing popularity uh, because it wouldn't stop a bullet. Now, perhaps he just didn't have time to visit the 21st century um, 
to get better armor before he was sucked into the lost land. But we know that's not true because in this same picture, he's rocking a pair of Levi's. So why did he not pick up a Kevlar vest when he visited our century to get his combat boots? It's kind of a silly question, but uh, without a good in-game explanation, the character can start to feel like a stereotype. Um, as a result, what, meant, what was meant to be inclusion can wind up feeling like ridicule because you know, why would he dress this impractical way? Um, it, uh, the lack of cultural understanding, the fact that he has no real tribe, it can, um, it can create problems for the relatability of his character. So somewhere between contact and disintegration, sort of not realizing his nativeness might just be a backdrop. Um, so, and I will pass it on to, back to Justin. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Chris. And so next thing we're gonna be talking about is Prey. Um, not a lot of people remember Prey, but in my opinion, it was an enjoyable game. Um, so basically you start the game with a protagonist who is, you know, solely native, uh, Tommy. And uh, Tommy is a Cherokee mechanic living on a reservation. Um, he's spending the day or the evening basically at a bar um, with his girlfriend and his grandfather when suddenly everybody's abducted by aliens. And, you know, I know when I hang out on the res, this happens to me all the time. Um, and, you know, graphically, the game is certainly pretty, um, in my opinion, especially for its time. And an interesting piece, you know, that happens off of the storyline is uh, your grandfather, you know, passes away and he unfortunately doesn't make it, but he passes along spiritual powers to Tommy. Um, he, these powers allow him to move through walls as well as use some portals. Um, they also give him a wonderful, like, spirit hawk, um, which I remembered very well for the game. Uh, my co-panelist did not remember at all. Um, it made me sound like a crazy person for a minute, but, um, it was a very interesting step, you know, for a lot of different reasons. It was one of the first games to be, uh, a real kind of survival horror shooter. That was a little bit more modern. Um, it was one of the few games that actually started to use things like portals and interesting mechanics that you would see later on in game development. Um, in terms of its development itself, it started with Human Head Studios and then went under contract for 3D Realms before finally being published by 2K Games. Um, its development was essentially, you know, almost over a decade. Um, and part of the reason for that is it was very difficult to integrate um, a lot of Cherokee narratives, um, I think, in a meaningful way. And there were also economic reasons that, you know, it happened as well. Um, in terms of some of the initial concerns, people were very worried that uh, gamers would be able to relate to a Cherokee protagonist. Um, you know, and overall, I, I don't think that has necessarily been an issue from anyone I've talked to anecdotally who played the game. Um, but, you know, one piece in terms of its um, level of understanding of Cherokee culture, you know, so the voice actors who did um, a lot of the voice work for the game, um, they were both Plains Cree. Um, Different, different tribe, you know, and at the end of the day, you know, they have um, a lot of cultural differences. Even when you talk about the Cherokee, like they're broken up into multiple bands and clans. Um, and even, you know, as a tribe, their culture is going to be very, very different, you know, like Oklahoma Cherokee versus, you know, some of the folks who were relocated to other parts of the country. Um, now, in just the background of the game, so as the game was being developed, um, you had Congress passing legislation for the Navajo Code Talkers. Uh, most folks are familiar with Code Talkers, you know, primarily uh, during World War II, who basically used their native and indigenous languages to protect uh, military information in code. Um, a lot of folks don't know that this uh, practice actually started in World War I. Um, and it actually didn't include just Cherokee, but it included the, you know, Com uh, Comanche, Choctaw, Hopi, um, Navajo, and then Muskegee. But, you know, in terms of, um, again, this honoring, this was a tremendous thing for, you know, the U.S. to acknowledge really the contributions of Native Americans in the military. Natives actually have the highest service rate compared to, like, their population uh, for any minority. And the U.S. generally does not acknowledge it. Um, so this was really big. So we're seeing some progress on two fronts. And then, um, unfortunately, um, in February 2000 and 
2006, uh, George W. Bush actually proposed eliminating all of urban Indian healthcare programs, um, which this is huge. So Native Americans are the only group in the United States that by you know, federal law um, has to have access to health care. The federal government has guaranteed that as a part of treaty obligations. Um, I remember when I started the presentation and said that basically most natives actually live off of reservations. So all of the urban health care centers, these are all the health care centers where actually Native Americans come for care. And I know a lot of people might say, well, you know, why don't the natives just go to, you know, the regular hospital or whatnot. Um, but the truth of the matter is, is a lot of times natives face a lot of discrimination. They, they're not well understood um, for, by a lot of medical providers. And, you know, it ends up leading to much poor care. Um, but besides that, you know, the, the government promised it and it's an obligation that should be there. So um, it was debated and fought. Um, but, you know, if they still cut the budget for urban health care programs by about 110 million, which is massive, um, especially considering that for um, uh, urban programs, about 1% of the total funding for Indian health services goes to urban programs. So that's a huge, huge difference in terms of the care that you can give. Um, and then unfortunately the trend ended up continuing in 2007 where the BIA budget, you know, which is different than Indian Health Services, it still provides a lot of support to tribes. Um, it's less linked directly with some of the health care aspects, but that budget was cut by 65 million. Um, so you're talking about, okay, so Congress is honoring folks and then six years later, you're having a massive defunding of, you know, the, the same people and the elders who honestly fought to make sure that the country um, survived. So anyway, so prey in terms of our analysis, um, we put it really more within disintegration you know, pretty firmly because um, again, the development, you know, was ongoing. Um, there were economic issues and, but overall it was really a pretty big step forward in my opinion. Um, imperfect and problematic, you know, it didn't necessarily have um, probably the best cultural representation, but at least it had some understanding of native storytelling and at least tried to be thoughtful um, and at least had a usage of a totem or, you know, something similar. Um, and the core, you know, gameplay mechanics were also interesting and hopefully also a step forward. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. All right. All right, so then we're going into uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Um, obviously not an unfamiliar game to most people, at least if anybody's probably seen the movies. <clears throat> even the remakes. And I have done it yet again. How every single time. All right. Here we join archaeologist Laura Croft after she has her technical difficulties too. As she journeys to the hidden South American city of Paititi, it is a very pretty game. Uh, befriends its inhabitants, fights terrorists, probably followed her there, of course, steals a sacred artifact sort of on purpose, which triggers a cataclysm that, of course, then she has to stop uh, by doing some rituals, narrowly avoiding human sacrifice, who hasn't, and taking it upon herself to save the city from the big bad, again, which she brought there, I'm sure, Kalima. All right, so probably not actual game footage, but it looks like it fits right in. Meanwhile, all this game is uh, coming out. Uh, organizations in South America are publicly denounced Peruvian government for failing to protect uncontacted tribes. The deforestation in the Peruvian Amazon affecting local indigenous groups without their cons uh, consultation for the government's aggressive government growth, I believe is what the bottom of that says. Great. <laughs> And yet here we are. Um, so there was lots of research involved. Uh, supposedly there was work with the cultural advisor. I uh, don't think it was anybody of the indigenous tribes that worked with them because they didn't mention it and everything. They definitely would have mentioned that and said who was doing, who was doing uh, the advising on that. Um, they had inadvertently glorified a colonizing protagonist in worldview. Uh, 
failed to really portray indigenous people as relatable or realistic culture. And it's possible that the initial intent was to portray the indigenous culture in a more realistic light, but abandon it possibly due to production difficulties. There was a production company change during the middle of it. Uh, and as Chris can you know, tell you from his perspective that uh, things happen behind the scenes that don't always at the get at the start of things um, wasn't intended at all. And where does this fall on our model of acculturation? Uh, we went with pseudo independence. Uh, there's marginalization, the culture's included, but imperfectly or inconsistently represented. Uh, it's put on a pedestal one moment and then dragged through the mud the next. Um, I did wanna mention that it does have a serious problem uh, with the white savior. Uh, these people live in a jungle in, the, in Peru, hidden away from everyone, having thrived there for ages. And then suddenly this white European woman shows up and the villagers have her do things for her that nobody there could possibly do. So, thanks, Lara. Like, what would we have done without you? Okay, so the next game we're going to take a look at is This Land is My Land. Um, this entered early access in 2019. It is not uh, completely finished yet. Um, so... In this land, you play as the leader of a warrior camp in the 19th century West. You repel invaders who are settling your lands and rally other camps uh, and groups to your cause. This game probably takes place in 1869 or later based on the railroads and firearms available in the game. Uh, and so I wanted to show you a map of what the West looked like at that time. You can see the state borders are actually pretty close to what they are today. But it's important to know that not all of these are officially states yet. Some of them are territories. Uh, so they have their own constitutions and they're not beholden to federal law yet. Uh, and that is important because all of these states or territories were built on land originally occupied by indigenous peoples. And each state had to find state or territory had to find its own way of grappling with those people who were already there. Um, so, and also on this map in, in red are Indian reservations as of 1868. You'll notice a very large um, section where present day Oklahoma is, uh, that is just labeled Indian territory. Um, so the way that a lot of these territories dealt with the indigenous population, they had to tacitly encourage kind of off the books violence against them um, the railroads were bringing a large number of people westward and there was an extreme demand for land uh, and what would wind up happening is the governments would turn a blind eye to acts of violence against indigenous people so that these settlers could come and take their land. Um, so real briefly, in, in 1930, the idea of Indian territory was created by President Jackson and Congress, uh, who decided that there's too little land back east to share with the indigenous people who lived there anymore. They did a forced relocation, which is sometimes called the Trail of Tears. Um, and the deal, I say deal, but the ultimatum they gave the, um, the tribes who lived there was that they would be relocated from their ancestral homes in the east and given an equivalent amount of land in Indian territory and they would receive title to that land in perpetuity. And they signed a treaty saying uh, just as much. Um, sort of the problem with that is that the US had already had a long history of ignoring treaties they'd signed with indigenous nations. And uh, in fact, in the uh, 90 years between the Declaration of Independence and the uh, date the game takes place, the US had signed more than 370 treaties with indigenous nations and they or their citizens had subsequently violated every single one of them. Um, rather than enforce the treaties, the US had a pattern of creating new ones, pushing indigenous territory ever westward until ultimately none was left except reservations. Um, Indian indigenous nations of the West hadn't signed any treaties, but they had been dealing with decades of encroachment from uh, settlers and missionaries on their own ancestral territories. Uh, so these lands, contra contrary to the romantic notion of the Old West, were not untamed. They had a huge indigenous population. Uh, this is the starting camp that you get in the game, and this is not historically unreasonable. Um, these are, this is a Shoshone encampment 
uh, circa 1870, and the, you know, the TPs and the general design are accurate. But what the game doesn't show, what a lot of games don't show, are these vast cultural and civic centers that dotted the West. Um, this is Acoma Pueblo. Uh, it is a, basically a small city. It has been continuously inhabited for the last 2,000 years. Um, there are thousands or hundreds of inhabitants, it varies, um, and there are dozens of these that, um, that dotted the West. In fact, the West is expected to have had a population of about 100,000 indigenous people at the time the game takes place. The game's main concept, uh, that of organizing a broader resistance against encroaching white settlers, does have some basis in history. There were decades of sustained resistance in California by at least a dozen, or sorry, by at least half a dozen tribes. Eventually, the U.S. Army was set in to put it all down. There's also a historical precedent for charismatic individuals who could create these multi-tribe conglomerates uh, and organize them into a fighting force. Um, right around the time that this game takes place, an Oglala Lakota named Red Cloud helped to organize a coalition of Plains tribes, and waged, a, waged a successful campaign against U.S. forces, sacked a bunch of forts, and ultimately got the U.S. to concede and renegotiate a treaty that was more favorable um, to the, to the multi-tribe coalition. Uh, I want to touch briefly on indigenous warfare. Uh, it was sometimes customary for a non-violent style of warfare to be preferable. Uh, it was more honorable to run into combat, touch your opponent, and then run out without being touched yourself. This was more preferable to drawing blood and killing. Some cultures call this counting coup, although it varies from culture to culture. Actual bloodshed was usually limited in scope. Large-scale violence, like armies fighting armies, was extremely rare. Uh, it was undesirable by many indigenous cultures. So you can imagine the culture shock and the existential threat they faced when this white enemy appeared who preferred to fight from afar, who preferred lethal violence uh, and um, preferred bloodshed over the nonviolent option. So these beliefs might be echoed in the game's karma system. Um, I discovered that killing people lowers your karma score while intimidating them and knocking them out, which is a lot more difficult, raises that score. Um, in fact, other camps will not join you if your karma score is too low. I discovered this myself in my game after I killed like 80 people and no one would join my cause anymore. Uh, they believe you're a disreputable, a dishonorable person. They won't follow you. Um, so given all this, where does this land fall on the acculturation model? I'm making a case for pseudo-independence. Um, the developers, it seems, begin to realize that systemic racism does exist. They're generally sympathetic to a minority culture. They don't always do anything about it um, in terms of activism or legislation. Uh, and they seem to understand minority cultures based on how similar they are to their own culture. In fact, one of the developers has given an interview in the past in which they said that the game was born of a desire to play as a Native American warrior. So that's good because there's at least an attempt at representation. But the protagonist is explicitly pan-indigenous and represents all tribes, large and small, from across all the, what is currently the United States. So there are some problems with representation here. We're obfuscating the individual cultures that did fight in the West with every indigenous culture in the country. Um, and indigenous, individual culture is important to the story of the multi-tribe coalition. It's about a bunch of different nations who might have previously been in conflict with each other who put aside their differences to unite against a, a bigger threat. Um, and there's a little more cartoon nudity coming up, you've been warned. Um, the lead developer cites uh, the works of Karl May as inspiration. He was a 19th century German author um, who popularized stories about Native Americans in Europe, but often his indigenous characters would take on German archetypes and not Native archetypes. They would do things that Germans would find honorable, not natives. For example, his main character, Winnetou, upon his death, asks some settlers to sing an Ave Maria for him. And in his final moments, he is quietly dignified by his conversion to Christianity. And here he is, presumably, rising up into heaven. So they did things that Germans, uh, stuff that a German audience would have liked, but a native audience might not have found representative. Uh, so there are a couple of big old caveats with this. Um, this in, these quotes are all from an interview with a single dev years ago, people change, and this game is also in early access and games change too. Uh, so take it away, Lisa.
All right, so next we have Never Alone. And we did choose this specifically to be our last pre uh, game for the presentation. And it was released in 2014. Get this to come in. Can I never get it to Let me go forward for me? And we, uh, we do have only a few minutes left, Lisa. Great. <laughs> All right, so Never Alone, as you see, it's a puzzle platformer, uh, and it features a young Inupiat girl named Nuna and her Arctic fox as they set out to find the source of an eternal blizzard that actually threatens the survival of everything they've ever known. Um, it's narrated by a master storyteller in the spoken Inupiat language, and it's translated using subtitles as you saw as you play the game, lots of different languages covered. Uh, and it's inspired by the traditional story of Canuck Sayuka, passed down for thousands of years, as told by Robert Nazareth Cleveland and, and transcribed by his daughter, uh, Minnie Gray, who also was the keeper of the story after her, after her father's passing. And in that tradition, uh, the person who's told the story the longest is actually the owner of that story. So uh, that was actually uh, Robert's story. And then you hear, we have some uh, images of the gameplay that they have helping aids of spirits with Nuna and the Fox have any chance of survival in a land where it's impossible. Obviously the Arctic is unforgiving. You can imagine for a child. Uh, here they escape uh, the Aurora Borealis and in their culture, the Aurora Borealis is said to have been ch spirits of children who've gone off to live in the sky and they would warn children to put up your hood uh, so that the spirits wouldn't come down at night and take their head to play with it like a ball. And here we have, uh, so this was designed by the Cook Inlet Tribal Council. Uh, they met up with Upper One Games and partnered with, or they created Upper One Games and partnered with Eline Media to co-develop and, and co-publish. Um, they wanted to ensure it was inclusive between the Alaska Native people and Eline team. So it was lots of back and forth with them. I'm sorry, so this, we're running out of time. Uh, can you do the, the wrap up, please? Or, or maybe I can you give you a couple minutes, but we need to end this soon. Yeah. Uh, and we just wanted to put this as our final, uh, our final game because it is, it does fall on the autonomy within the game. Um, wow. <laughs> I can speed talk, but I don't know if I can speed talk that fast and actually have anybody understand what I'm saying. But this is the game that we would all want any game developers and designers who are making a game and want to include any indigenous persons in the game as a protagonist, antagonist, they maybe ask people um, in the tribes or work with them such as they did with Never Alone. So this um, included everyone they had a lot of cultural respect and they included the language which was a strong point for the game and any of the games nowadays with four indigenous uh, cultures should want to do all of these things to make sure uh, it's respectful and make sure that they are really not a, you know being offensive especially overtly um, and I I think we're just gonna have to wrap that up right now <laughs> Well, thank you guys, everyone, for attending. Um, you know, we have a uh, contact information uh, on the next slide, I think. Um, yep. So if, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and uh, it's been great to see you all here. And thanks again to our great moderators, Lucy and Boots. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of virtual Balticon. And uh, we also just uh, put the presentation on the Google Drive. So please feel free. I know we ran through the last part of it, but um, please feel free to you know take a copy and just in case if you have any questions, just contact us.